Okay, when last we met, we had uh, talked about the Declaration of Independence and kind of how it is written and that kind of thing. Now we're going to look at what's inside of it and then move on to the battles of the revolution, which will catch us up to date with where we're at in class today, I believe. First off, what is the purpose of the Declaration of Independence? So um, it's written by a committee of five men, the main author being Thomas Jefferson. It is presented to the Continental Congress where it is signed, sealed, and delivered to the King of England, and it formerly severs us from England. So what is the purpose? Why did we do the whole thing? Well, in addition to telling um, England to go away, we're trying to send a message of unity to the American citizens throughout the colonies. Everyone is needed for the effort in order to gain our independence from England. So this document, a big part of the reason is to let everyone know this is what's been decided. We have leaders. Now, they represent each colony, but granted, there's not a national election at this point in time. There's no way to have that. But these leaders have decided that we're going to leave England, and we want everybody to know it. And next, we want to let the uh, international community know it. We are seeking support from the powers of the day, of the day. those powers primarily being France, Spain, the Netherlands. We're trying to convince these potential allies that we're justified because all of those nations, and in fact, everywhere in England, is ruled by a king. And as a king is the ruler, we don't want the kings to see the King of England side of things. We want to make sure everyone knows how badly he's been treated. So there's a list of grievances that are in there. They're in that document presented by uh, Jefferson. And, of course, Jefferson very much tries to paint a very cruel picture of the King of England. We want to establish America as a credible member of the international community. And this is a direct quote out of the Declaration that part of the reason for the Declaration is to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all the other acts and things which independent states may have brought deep. So we're saying we want to be independent and we want to be treated as an independent nation. The legacy of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence has resonated with oppressed people worldwide from the Flemish to the French, from Venezuela <clears throat> to Vietnam. It's a document that is, is inspirational and revolutionary. It is also aspirational. So this first line is what we are aspiring to. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That's something you aspire to, and that's uh, Jefferson kind of put a finish line there, but it's a moving finish line, and we have not quite got there yet. Uh, no matter how you look at it, certain parts of this country, different groups are looked down upon. And we'll talk about the history of that. Um, and it's real easy to kind of say, oh, well, it's this group or that group today. But again, that's been a moving line. There's been many groups who have been put down through the years and uh, for, for various reasons, various prejudices. More about that later. Let's talk about this, uh, the colonies. If you look at the colonies... Now, we're trying to get the colonies to revolt against England, but within the colonies, not everybody wants to revolt. There are the loyalists who, of course, sided with Britain. They did not wish to leave. They, they, you know, there's a number of reasons. They may have been scared. They may have thought the king was doing a fantastic job. Clearly, they probably didn't live in Boston or they wouldn't have thought that. But throughout the war, and depending on where you go, you know, if you're more up in Massachusetts, probably not this number, but as you're further away from Massachusetts, 20 to 30 percent of the total colonists, if 100 percent is the total, 20 to 30 percent side with Britain. Patriots are the people who are dedicated to revolting against Britain. So you're thinking, well, if it's 20 to 30 percent of Americans who are siding with England, and clearly we got 70 to 80 percent who want to get rid of England. That's an easy win. Not exactly. You see, there's a number of people who refuse to take sides. There's a number of people who set this one out. 
who do nothing, 40 to 45 percent is actually all who really, really wanted to be rid of the yoke of England. So more than 50,000 loyalists, a.k.a. Tories, um, fled the colonies because they really didn't have to fight. The reason they didn't have to fight is England has its own army, but they were getting harassed and, and bothered by the, by the patriots, and they saw that it was going to go badly, and 50,000 of the loyalists fled, most to Canada, some even went to Florida. And also, families are torn apart. A really good example is Benjamin Franklin. Very prominent patriot. Very prominent. Well, he was also a very prominent uh, citizen of the world. He lived in England for a number of years prior to the revolution. He was there seeking the uh, uh, support from the English lords and dukes over there for his son, William, to gain a royal governorship. He managed to get his son appointed as governor of New Jersey. As a result of which, William never turned back on his paycheck. He never turned back on England. He remained loyal to England and thus against his father. He returned, was a member of the Second Continental Congress, was a member of the party that drafted the Declaration of Independence, and very much a loyal patriot. His son never did. Also, if you were one of these Tories who left, you didn't get to sell your house. You got to run from your house. You lost your house. That's a big deal back in those days, as it would be today. Two battles today. We're going to talk about two battles of the Revolution. This is, uh, believe it or not, Boston. This is a part of Boston. It's Boston Harbor here. And uh, Boston is a very large place, and you have different parts of it. Charlestown is the main location we're going to talk about today. And then Bunker Hill. Now, we call this battle the Battle of Bunker Hill, but it probably should be called the Battle of the Hills because there's actually three hills involved, the main one being Breed's Hill. The main fighting is Breed's Hill. If you take a look at your map here, you'll see Breed's Hill is not very high at all. It's only 62 feet in elevation. Bunker Hill is 110 feet, and perhaps because it is taller, that's why we call it that. But the most of the fighting takes place at Breed's. So British troops in June of 1775. Okay, so election and Concord have taken place. April 19th, 1775. The British troops want to secure Boston Harbor, and they plan to march and place men. And, and once you get men up there, you can put cannons up there. So cannons can fire off into the harbor. Um, so they want to get this high ground. The high ground is always important in battle. Spies relayed the plans of the British to the Patriots. Overnight, literally, the British went to sleep, and they woke up and found fortifications on Breed's Hill and Bunker's Hill. And again, if you take a look at our map, fortifications on Breed's Hill are more significant. The Bunker Hill is not so much. Breed's Hill is where most of your, re your reinforced positions are. The fighting is brutal. The losses are heavy. And the British took the hill, but they lost... 40% of their men, well over a 1,000. This ends up being a moral victory for the Americans. And the Americans basically had to abandon their position because they ran out of ammunition. And there's an old saying that the, um, that the commander there said, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Well, as you can see, the whites of your eyes show up quite easily from a long distance off. So that's not what he said. He said, actually... Don't fire until you can see the color of their eyes. When you can tell that guy's got blue eyes, shoot him. So they let the British come closer and closer before they fired and, and really wore them out doing so. The British are going uphill, and again, high ground is key in a battle. But they ran out of ammunition and had to abandon the position. So we would call it a win for the British in that they gained the position, but a loss because they lost 40% of their men getting it. So the war goes very badly um, at the start. We have declared our independence in the summer of 1776 following these battles in Boston, in the Boston area. And we have a Continental Army. The Continental Army is poorly trained, poor
poorly fed, poorly everything. And they've gotten beaten and beaten and beaten. And they retreat in the winter to a place called Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where they have winter quarters. So uh, a lot of the soldiers would have gone home. Some of them stayed. You uh, sign up for a period of time, but, you know, if the situation's bad and you need to go home, people went home without being given permission. George Washington convenes his, uh, his, his officers and says, I've got a plan. This is a good one. You're going to like this. And they said, man, this ain't going to work. We've got no, no morale. Soldiers are sick and dying. He said, how many have we got? So we got 2,400 men. He said, that's all I need. His idea is to cross the frozen Delaware River on Christmas night, 1776. These guys, now ill shod means they don't have shoes. And very famous portrait here, or a version of a very famous portrait of Washington on top of his, astride his horse as they cross the Delaware with his men rowing in the night. Washington counting on the enemy not being prepared. The enemy, he thought, not going to be prepared because it's Christmas. They're probably eating and drinking and celebrating the holiday. They're not ready to fight. The group he's after is a German mercenary unit. Now, mercenary is an army for hire. And German mercenary unit, the Hessians are notorious. They're great fighters. They're mean and vicious, but they're paid to fight. They're not fighting for the English crown. They're fighting for the English paycheck. So they're probably not fully committing to preserving the British Empire. The Americans win. They rout, rout the Hessians. They get their food. They even take their boots off of them. And they take all their supplies, any blankets, any uniforms they can get. And then they march northwest to Princeton, New Jersey. There they outflank the Redcoats. This is a week later. That, tr that tried to cut them off, and they win a second battle. So Christmas night, they take Trenton, Princeton. That's a week later on January 1st. Very, very important victories. The American Army was on the ropes. We were soon to be out of gas, and Washington pulls off the, the Hail Mary, the victory, the last second win, and lives to fight another day, as he himself said.